Jade Cocoon, story of the Tamameu. What is the Jade Cocoon and who are the Tamameu? I don't know. Elrim, god of the forest, source of all life. He creates divine spirits. They're furries. The spirits created a beast in their own image, the beasts of knowledge. Elrim says, hey, that's chill and all, just uh, don't fuck them. They fuck them. And they make, like, twins of light and darkness. They might be snakes, I'm, I'm not sure, it barely matters. But basically, Elrim is pissed, curses you and your village. You get attacked by the Oni Boo Boo, whose wing dust stuff puts people to sleep. Enter you, Levant, until you rename him. A young cocoon master. They task you to go into the forest to get the calabas herb. Weed joke. Because as a cocoon master, you can Pied Piper all the scrimblos of the forest, and pot might be the one thing that wakes up everyone. Or not. They're not sure, but it's better than not driving the plot. But alas, you can't use scrunklies without... <laughs> you can't use scrunklies without first purifying them. Enter Mabu, your wife and a Nagi woman. Hey, you two. Getting a little hot up here if you know what I mean. F*** off, Louie. You're all talk, and a bucktooth idiot, too. Capable of performing Nagi magic, used to purify, merge, and spin them into silk? What? I'll revisit that. Jade Cocoon is a creature collector in which you collect minions to later use yourself to fight more minions. Or in the rare occasion, another person, who also commands minions. Your usual mon game affair, except you can also beat the tar out of the tamer after you wipe out their mons. Something interesting though is that your minions level up from murder, while you yourself only level up from capturing new ones. Like, you can do a long, drawn out fight, swap to your dude and cap him and your minion will gain no experience for that. If you kill something as Levant, nobody gains anything. See, violence is never the answer. Unless you get your dog to do it. You're really only leveling up your guy to make him better at capturing stuff, and also to tank a few hits while healing stuff. Cause you can only use items mid-battle as Levant. You gotta switch to heal, and if he goes down, you're toast. Probably my biggest complaint. That and the tank controls. But I bet you can't even understand! Clearly I'm not wanted here. I'll make my leave. Oh my. Good heavens. Good day. Granted, by holding triangle, your dude will just run forwards, only needing to be steered. And he rolls off walls too, so I actually found myself just like letting him go blindly, short of picking pathways and, you know, avoiding some battles. There's 175 minions in the game. Oh, sorry, I mean there are infinite monsters! Because you can merge any two monsters together to make something new. And this is the most dynamic monster fusing feature I've seen in a monster tamer. Merging doesn't just pick you a new minion from the roster, it actually combines features from both parents. Be it horns or wings, textures, body shape, as well as stats, elements, moves, and magic. As well as gaining levels too. I actually figured the smartest play was to capture everything to give Levant levels, and then fusing everything together, but not only does that muddy any strategy or moveset you might be going for, but your minions gain more stats from murder levels than merging levels. And that's my tip to you! Only really merge for movesets and combining elements, maybe. Every minion has one of four elements by default. Fire, water, wind, and earth. The type chart is always on screen when it matters, so they keep that fairly easy to understand. Although I think they should have swapped the colors for earth and wind, but that's just me. But merging two minions of separate elements gives the new one both, capable of using moves of either type. Which is almost necessary because although there's four elements, they only give you three party slots. Meet my team! The water minion and descendant of the starter minion, Arpatron. The earth minion, my highest raw damage and was once turtle shaped, Pudding. And my speedster with both fire and wind elements to cover my weaknesses, Chris. While having more elements does cover more bases, there are some spells that require total devotion to one type to use, like the diva spells, which transform the environment to buff one type. Also, I just adore the name Arpatron. It's like a fake monster name that somebody came up with on the spot. Actually, they're all like that. <laughs> Equally silly as they are unmemorable. Except for a couple select cases. Karn? Huh? 
It would probably be better if more of them had actual art instead of just letting our imagination decipher this. There's actually some art of a few species in the manual that I didn't know were there until I was literally writing that last line and went to check. These are cool. I would kill for more of them. I mean, like, the case is big enough. This game has one disc. And as I had all this recorded and in the editing stage, I found an art book online for this game and its sequel, and these designs slap, dude! The 3D models just don't do them justice, unfortunately. I wish I had the $200 to burn, too. I'm not big on art books, but this is one that I would love to actually have. Most of the names feel like they were automatically generated. Some of the names are like, ah, yes, the four elements of this species. Paterade, Mafraid, Turfraid, Ragafraid. And then others feel like they just bashed the keyboard or put sounds together. Ska grip? Old. Skmane. Frig. Arvelzak. <laughs> Noob wee? <laughs> I do think the combat could be better. You bring three minions around with you, but you can only use one at a time. While well, you can run into up to three wild ones. And because nothing in the wild has more than one element, it's a simple case of just throw out what they're weak to. Which becomes annoying when most of the areas are element themed with very little variation. So at a glance you can be like, oh well this area is full of fire minions, just whip the place with a water minion. But even if you have the type advantage, it'll still most likely take like two to three hits to kill something, and you only have the mana for two swings with an elementally charged attack. And while you do regain a bit of health and MP after battle, and defending mid-match can trickle some in, if you miss an attack, it's devastating. A single miss can double how long a match takes. Like, ah, oh, boners, I missed, guess I better defend for the next three turns. Wish they would also tell you how much mana something uses instead of just giving you kind of estimates. Arpatron's flop attack brings me so much joy though. A high speed stat doesn't just improve your initiative, you can sometimes hit multiple times against a slower monster. Which I think is of note, I think that's neat. And of course there are status ailments like poison and stone and even attack add-ons like a boosted critical chance or doing extra damage to bipeds with break leg. The only way to reliably gain money in this game is to spin unused minions into silk and then sell that silk to the general store. How you turn a dragon into a spool of thread? You got me! Not that it's all that important. While you can buy weapons, armor, and supplies, you can also just find that stuff or it's given to you throughout the plot. I did restock on healing stuff, but it was mostly paranoia over necessity. I think I died twice, and it was a fluke crit, and then I didn't realize that bosses were immune to certain status stuff one time. Not a hard game at all. And the prices for stuff get absolutely ridiculous late game, too. Like, there's an 80k sword, when I think the most money I ever had at one point was 10k. Alright then, keep your sword. The story's a little confusing, there are a lot of named things with vague descriptions. It's a 14 hour game from 1998, but it is very story driven with some impactful moments. Uh, so for those of you that care, here's the spoiler skip. After some tutorial time with a masked man who's honestly just rude AF about you and your dad. Just the son of a coward. <laughs> Yay! Murder! See, you're the son of the previous cocoon master of Cyrus, Riquettes, the Lion of Peril, who went missing into the forest some time ago. Some claim he's dead, some say he just abandoned you and your mother. You cried out in your sleep last night. Are you alright? No, Mom. I just f***ing died. You leave into the beetle forest to find that dank kush, which is where you meet another cocoon master, Chorus. After proving yourself to him with some mad beats, he reveals himself as a friend of your dad's and agrees to prepare you for your task ahead. This is also where you capture your first minion, Arpatron. After proving yourself to Chorus, he tells you of a birdman named Kikinak in the next forest who might be able to help you find the cure you're looking for. You meet the birdman, voiced by Cosmo. Hey, you're a cocoon master, right? What do you say to a quick little duel? and is the descendant of the sex-deviant furry from the backstory. <laughs> That's kind of neat. He has the stuff you need, but to get enough of it, you gotta find the avocado people of the next forest. You trade your engagement ring for the herb, which Mabu is oddly chill about. But since Totoyamu is a being of greed, he doesn't show you where it grows unless you bring him more treasure. 
See, he was cursed to be the protector of the Divine Tree, the source of all life, by Elrim as punishment for his greed, just as Kikinak was cursed to his form by lust. Y you see where this is going? No, you don't, because that's where the Seven Sins thing ends. It's just these two. Maybe you're the birth of the third? I don't know, it's all very non-literal and up to interpretation. Anyways, as corrupt higher-ups do, the notion that you may have access to the Divine Tree, they insist you capture it, implying that the Calabas would only be a band-aid solution and that cutting the life of the forest at its core would be away with the Onibubu at its core and then we wouldn't have to worry anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you ruin everything. An old lady gets sacrificed, which ruins everything else. Your wife turns into a fairy. Turns out you're the Chosen One of Light, and you need to defeat the Chosen One of Darkness. You gotta fight a bunch of baboon people that represent your insecurities, as well as the inner demons of the people around you. The fire boss represents the doubt in Chorus's heart, and his worry that the fear in what people don't understand and the existence of cocoon masters at all will result in the destruction of the forest. Yeah. The wind boss is made up of the jealousy in Kelmar, the blacksmith's son, who's in love with Mabu, but tradition means she'd be married to you, regardless of what anyone wants. And the earth boss is the incarnation of the wrath of the forest over, you know, how you ruin their big penis, and also the worry in Mabu that you might leave her like your father did your mother. And then the chosen one of darkness. Whoa, the masked man from my dreams? Yeah, he's your dad. And instead of defeating him and vanquishing darkness, you both rock out together, freeing the light and darkness snake dragon things, and grant humans a fruit of knowledge which bears the seeds of responsibility, apparently. And I truly don't know what that means, but it was cool, I guess. The story in Jake Cocoon is so non-literal and up to interpretation, like, to a frustrating degree. I absolutely loved the game, but even looking back through the footage, I have no idea why anything was happening or what the repercussions of anything you did was. Like, you went out to heal the village and stop the Onibubu from attacking, I get that part. And you fixed it by playing music at a specific spot, maybe, with a specific person. You, you play music the whole game, I, I don't get it. The guardian deities of light and darkness shall be released by the twin dragons, who are literal physical things that are right here. What do they do? And how? They use a lot of ancient mumbo jumbo talk and it goes directly over my head. A lot of unexplained names and terms that are textbook gobbledygook. Azura, Mephesis, Twin Dragons of Kemuel, Kamari and Kaya Gates, Chosen One of Darkness, Chosen One of Light, Beasts of Divine Power, Divine Spirits, Alcana, Menek, King Karis. This guy is Totoyamu and Mamon? Actually makes me feel dumb. Like, they're taking the entirety of the Tolkien lore and jamming it into a 12-hour game. And Kikinak told me to search out Yamu when I only ever interacted with his dad. That half a second right there is the only time I saw him. And he's in all the promo art, like he's a main part of the party or something. Apparently he's in a secret, skippable side quest. JRPGs were a mistake. Of course a game this obscure, there's no discussion around it, no real answers to find. I loved the themes at hand and the elements they played with. Even with a game this short, I still felt the depth of the characters and the world and really felt for them. But boy howdy did it just feel like I was doing stuff because they told me to. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend I followed what was going on. And after that's all said and done, the game hands you an endless dungeon that gets progressively harder and also you can't leave, this is it, this is the game now. Granted, there are plenty of minions here that you can't find anywhere else, and there are boss monsters that give you unique skins for your minions, but I don't know, I got through like four sections and stopped seeing the point. Developed by Genki in collaboration with Katsuya Kondo, a character designer for Studio Ghibli, giving us a ton of Ghibli charm in the art designs and gorgeous opening cinematic, as well as the whimsical nature focus that Ghibli's known for. And you can see it on the box, right there. What an awful cover. <laughs> Who is that? Padimel? A bug that shows up in the first area and has no importance to the game? Goofy, even. Anyways, I'm already a huge fan of this style of pre-rendered background, static camera shot games on the PS1, like Digimon World and Parasite Eve, and then to pile in the gorgeous natural landscapes that Ghibli does so well. Not much can stand up to this game in terms of art design, in my opinion. The soundtrack absolutely does it justice, too. The 
full game only took me about 14 hours to complete, at first a refreshing surprise considering how intimidatingly long most JRPGs are. But now I'm kinda pissed. I wanna stay in this world longer. I feel like the amount of voice acting really limited the space on the disc for actual content, because almost every single line in this game is voiced. I have a fine view of the forest. I love the forest. That is why I like it here. And not well. <laughs> Glad they auto scroll though. Do you still like the flute? If so, then be strong and gentle like the flute. You got it, buddy. I'm sorry, his hands are skilled, but his tongue is not. <laughs> <laughs>